Hello, happy Monday. Welcome back to OE TV, everyone. Debt markets are closed today for Columbus Day. Big apologies out there for the Mets fans out there being knocked out, but the Jets and Giants have winning records. So Brendan, Brendan McCarty coming on. Listen, he's a little bit more upset because of the performance of his Pats, but welcome back, Brendan. How are you, mate? I'm good. Hey, they won. They beat the lowly Lions yesterday. So, I mean, hey, anytime you shut out a team that's inept, it's great. <laughs> 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 and we also welcome back Matt Tuttle. How are you, Matt? I'm great. And I would add the Lions had the best offense coming into that game. So, True. you know, I'm, 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 I'm very optimistic about my Pats now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I'm outnumbered. Uh, this show is well brought to you by the wonderful team at Open Exchange. Look to them for all of your virtual event needs. Now, moving straight into the show. Are uh, there too many bears in the market? Bamel's bear market indicator is, has been sitting at 0.0, .0 for weeks now. We've seen comments over the weekend from Mohammed El Arian about that he fears that the US is a very high probability of a damaging recession that was totally avoidable. Strategist Asset Management's Courtney Rosenberger was interviewed on OETV last week, and they have the chances of a recession at 50-50. We can go on and on about bearish commentary, but gentlemen, we've been in the markets for a long time and when everyone is saying the same thing, I get nervous. Should I be concerned that there is a consensus bear thinking going on here and we could see a squeeze? Let's start with you, Matt. So, no, not necessarily. We, we believe that the term don't fight the Fed works really well when the Fed is easing. It also works really well when the Fed is tightening. So, you know, if we're back in you know, 2009 to last year and the Fed was easing, I would think that we were on the cusp of maybe a massive move to the upside. Now the Fed is, is tightening, they're coming out, they're saying we're gonna take the economy down. So, you know, I don't think you can look at sentiment numbers the same you would have looked at them before. I think the only thing you wanna be very cognizant of if you're shorting, which we are, and we're doing it aggressively, is you want to be very careful holding short positions overnight because the sentiment is so ridiculously bearish. Certainly, you could wake up one morning and see the market spike up 3%. Um, you know, you got CPI and PPI this week, you know, a, a cooler number. Yeah, you could see the market jump in a day. And certainly, you've got to expect some more kind of actions like we saw from the BOE. Chances are there's somebody else out there having trouble that's going to need a bailout. Um, you know, the other phrase I love, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Chances are there are a lot of people out there swimming naked right now. You could see, you know, one of the central banks have to step in and the market could pop. That doesn't change the fact that we're in a bear market. Brendan, I, I know that you might be a little bit of a fan of swimming naked as well. I'm not sure. But what are you thinking about the markets, though? <laughs> uh, nobody would want to see me swim naked um all right so one of the things that was interesting about last week we we follow uh, money we that's one of the you know driving forces i've been doing it since the day i came into the business uh, money goes in the system you tend to see rising assets money comes out of the system goes the other way uh seven of the last eight weeks coming into last week money was falling out of the system and guess what the s p was down I don't know, 13, 14%. Um, last week, though, money actually turned for the first time uh, since early September. Uh, the Fed balance sheet actually dropped the most since May. Uh, and there was a bunch of very, it was, it was an interesting week. We thought that maybe the S&P would stabilize. It was the first time that the Friday after a number since May went counter. So basically, Every time our Thursday numbers have come out since May, it's kind of time. The Fridays actually follow the market accordingly. So if the money went down, the market fell on Friday. If the money went up, money rose. The, the markets rose on Friday. This time around, money actually went up on Thursday. On Thursday, but the markets got pummeled on Friday. We are debating. So it is a bear market. It is a uh, the Fed is still fight is still pushing down. But was there a definite change in risk now? I wonder if investors have to have. I wonder if the end of September they capitulated and now we're in that permanent phase that you see as an financial advisor, 
that they're just constantly selling into every rally. Uh, we saw it in 02. We saw it probably from 09 to 2013, where re- the investors just didn't believe in the rally. And I think we may have hit that turning point. Um, it's just fascinating to me that the market couldn't get any traction on a bounce in asset money coming into the system. Uh, we'll see what Thursday number brings. But as long as money continues to come out on base, like on balance, if it continues to fall, I can't see the market bouncing much. Um, I was in talking to you guys before. One of the curious things was, was this candlestick formations. It was this shooting star at the lows. And I'm, you don't see them often. So I, I'm a, a little curious what follows this week based on the weekly and the monthly. They both have it. If you look at a lot of charts, they all have shooting stars at the lows. And I'm just curious what follows from here. <laughs> and I'm maybe, not sure. we'll do, maybe we'll do an episode of talking about the shooting stars and explain that to some of the viewers. I might need, need to freshen up on that one as well. <laughs> Let's, uh, Brennan, we talked, we, you and I have talked about sporting teams earlier this year. And one stock we didn't talk about at the time was Madison Square Garden Sports. Barron's had an article over the weekend that professional sports teams are worth more than ever. But Madison Square Garden stocks, stock, sports stock, I should say, it, it's, listen, it's languishing. It's like la- laid back versus everything else out there. The New York Knicks estimated value was $5.8 billion and the Rangers $2 billion. But the 3.6 billion market cap of MSGS is less than half of that estimated value of those teams. Most sports fans are aware of the Dolan discount, but if the Dolans do sell a stake, could we see a big bounce here? Brendan, uh, what do you think on this one? So I think you we talk, you look at when you look at that Madison Square Garden sports, you look at the same way as you look at Man U. Um, if you were to line their charts up together. Uh, I think the only difference is the British pound that separate the hitting the performance of Man U versus the price of MSGS. I think when you look at these sports teams, uh, Chelsea was a perfect example. Chelsea sold for over five billion dollars, I think it came to, and they valued Man U at four point two billion. And we asked why, and I think the difference literally comes down to your product. Man U has been going sideways for years. I mean, it's been a long time since they won anything. Well, the Knicks and the Rangers. When's the last time they really won anything? The Rangers had a good year last year, but they were, I, I look back at this, and in the, in the NHL standings the last four years, they're 12th place every year. Talk about mediocre. Uh, if your properties are not performing, your value is not that great. So you're, it's going to be naturally depressed, just like Man U. Now, if they sell stake in the value of the company, I think it could give it a boost, but I don't think it'll be, it'll be like an intervention. You know, I don't think it's, it, you're still dealing with a product that aren't great. The Knicks stink. Like they just haven't done anything in years and they got such a brand and I never understood why they can't do better. Like they're in the heart of basketball, the world. It's like they should do better, uh, but they're not. And I think that's what's fact weighing on the stock, just like Manchester United. It's the same sort of thing. It, I don't know if there's a natural value, a 20% discount to these sort of things, but Man U is trading a dis- 20% discount to Chelsea and MSGS in a way is trading at a 20% discount to its peers. Okay, Matt, what do you think about MSGS? So, you know, we're, we're chart guys. Um, I'm also a Boston basketball fan and agree with Brendan. I can't believe the Knicks can't put out a competitive team. But um, if you look at it on Friday, it had what you'd call a viable gap up, which in a bear market would be something that, you know, we might look to jump all over. But I'm sorry, in a bull market, it'd be something we'd look to jump all over. But we're not in a bull market. And it's getting really close to the 50-day moving average. I'd actually be looking at this more as a short if it bumps up against the 50-day moving average and fails. The only thing that could, could convince me to buy a stock like this is if Elon Musk comes out and says, hey, I'm buying Madison Square Sports, you know, rumor or actual the truth. But, you know, barring that, we're looking at this more as a budding short setup than something you buy right now. Okay. Uh, listen, I'm not a, a hockey or a basketball fan. It wasn't really a big sports in Australia when I was down there. So I got no comment on MSGS. <laughs> All right. Uh, the IMF is meeting uh, meeting this week. Yes, they're going to come out with the global doom and gloom forecasts and a possible $4 trillion loss in the world's economic output. All well-flagged information. But what about crypto? The G20's FSB is expected to announce plans to regulate the crypto and DeFi industry. There can be good things and bad things that can come from that. But how do you think crypto investors are going to react to the news that comes out of this? Matt, we'll start with you. 
So, I mean, the crypto bulls will react the same way they always react. Everything is great for crypto. Um, and, you know, and crypto, you know, Bitcoin specifically has actually held up, you know, somewhat and, and definitely a lot better than you would expect, given what's going on in the market. You know, at the, at the end of the day, though, we look at this as a risk asset. We look at it as a risk asset that doesn't have a lot you know, underpinning it or anything really underpinning it. So, I mean, I know I'll get attacked, but crypto is is not something that, uh, you know, we would be bullish on right here. But I'm sure the crypto bulls will look at anything as bullish and, you know, and certainly do look at this as a security and it's something that ought to be regulated as such. Okay. I agree fully on that. Maddie Sanders has covered a lot of this on the Crypto Dome show. But uh, Brennan, what do you think on this side of it? So the rules are considered tentative, guessing there'll never be any action. Based if they call them tentative, that means they don't have enough agreement to push them through. Um, stable coins are their focus because it's probably the only thing they can regulate. Um, most crypto guys will thumb their note like, "Yeah, good luck trying to regulate us. We're we're not regulative, whatever the right word is." But. Um, this is all, I mean, I go back to this is all about the central banks and the government's trying to retake control of the DeFi world. It sits outside the financial system. They can't regulate the money flows of it. Um, the markets over the last two years probably were driven in part by all the, like the wealth being created in the crypto world. So that was money on the outside that was pouring into the financial system and driving assets higher. Um, I think crypto invest, I mean, Bitcoin has been going sideways for the longest time. It's just, it's almost fascinating how long it's held, but um, and we actually think we we wrote a headline in one of our reports on Friday is crypto dead, <laughs> like retail. I, I, it's not dead, but you know, it, it, Bitcoin literally trades like the U.S. dollar right now. In fact, it probably trades more vol. It probably has less volatility than the U.S. dollar, strangely enough. But anyway, uh, I think crypto investors will laugh at this and move on. I, I just anytime the IMF does anything, I I just sort of like, oh, that's a good headline, yeah. That, they're talking about six months ago. That's great, too. <laughs> it's just the way they are. Okay, let's move on to earnings season. Q3 earnings season is here. So get ready for some next month, for the next month, for even more potential volatility in the markets. I did see a headline before I jump on, jumped on that Goldman is coming out saying that there could be some uh, downgrades in earnings coming through. But we're going to start with the ones coming through this week. And we've got PepsiCo. Uh, they're going to be reporting pre market on Wednesday. They've beaten revenue and EPS estimates in eight straight quarters, which is extremely impressive. But the market might be trying to tell us something here, despite Morgan Stanley expecting them to beat expectations. The share price has been selling off in the last couple of months ahead of these earnings. Are they starting to lose their pricing power or is this, or is this sell-off an opportunity, Brendan? Uh, so it's interesting. I never would have thought this in hindsight, but they trade like GAS and Conagra, you know, pricing power, uh, ability to move prices forward, you know, like Conagra, we spoke about last week and they were going to raise prices next year. And I think I asked what happens if they can't, uh, what if we can't pass through? Um, they're going to see higher revenue again. They'll probably have another beat in some regard in the current prices. And they'll probably agree. I mean, I, I think I paid $7 for a 12 pack of Pepsi a couple weeks ago. So I <laughs> didn't even realize it does at the register, but um I think they're going to run to margin pressure, just like GIS and CAG ran into. Um, and the chart itself, it seems to be rolling over. I, I wonder if investors are asking, is this the best the staples with the, like this model can get? Is this the best that the guys who constantly pass through their demand to higher prices, can they get away with this much further? And I think the chart is telling us that investors are seriously weighing that thought. Um, I mean, it's sitting right on support. So it's sort of like at that uncertain level. I think I talked about it was either Apple or Microsoft. It was sitting right on uncertainty like three or four weeks ago. And I had no idea which way it was going to go. But I can tell you that it's sitting on a point right now. It doesn't say the investors are super excited about it coming into the report. Another one of those shooting stars on that weekly candle there. Um, I wonder if a miss is on the table now or at least a miss on the outlook. I think that's what the investors may be pricing in based on the way it's trading. Okay. Now, Matt, we know you don't take positions in the earnings and so forth, but listen, you're struggling with the sun there, but I do want to get some insights on this too. Yeah, so in, in we don't hold over earnings, but we love the earnings plays. because you know, Especially in this market, 
you know, what we'd be looking for is companies that pop into some sort of resistance and we'd look to short them. So if you look at Pepsi on a daily chart, it's six points away from its 200 day moving average. So if it had any sort of pop on earnings towards that, we'd be looking at Pepsi as a short. The other thing you got to take into consideration, the consumer staples right now are, are, are acting differently from the standpoint of you've got all these fully invested portfolio managers who need to buy something. And in a market like this, from time to time, they flock to the consumer staples because, you know, a stock like Pepsi isn't going to open up down 20%. Whereas, you know, a Roblox or, or something else might. So, you know, it exacerbates the moves to the upside, but also to the downside. And again, on a daily chart, Pepsi's been on a straight line down. So this is this is not something we'd buy, but if it pops up on earnings season, it may be something we'd be interested in shorting. Okay. So Thursday, Delta reports pre-market. Lower fuel prices may have helped for this quarter, but higher ones are just around the corner. Considering the performance of their share price this year and consumers pulling back on spending, maybe this sell-off is priced in at these levels. Could we see a surprise here? Brendan. A um, couple of interesting things on DAL. They're seeing solid demand, which is not a surprise. We've all seen it. But they have capacity trains, constraints. We talked to the cruise lines last week where they were basically giving away tickets, driving their margins down. The airlines don't have to drive them. They, they are raising prices like crazy, as we all know. Uh, but they still have that big issue of capacity. Um, Cor Raymond James actually said that they think corporate travel is actually accelerating, which will help revenue to some extent, uh, help margins as well, because we all know that they strangle hold the corporate travel market as well. Um, I wonder, if I, I, the stock pivoted, like reversed course this week, even when energy prices rose, which actually said to me, I wonder if investors now are starting to see maybe Capacities unwinding. I think I, I was talking to somebody who said uh, their son was coming out of the Air Force and the airlines were hiring these pilots like crazy to put them on the planes. Um, I wonder if that's helping the capacity side. And if it's helping the capacity side, then that's more revenue against higher margins. So we just talked about Pepsi with shrinking margins, uh, but higher. I wonder, amazing, I'm going to say this. I wonder if Delta is getting more profitable. Um, I can't believe I said that I, with an airline. Um, but energy, like energy prices bounced again. I don't know if it's filtering through to jet fuel prices. I didn't look it up. But I, I think investors are actually beating, have, looking for a beat on the upside here. And the chart actually looks better like for a bounce. So I wouldn't say a long-term bounce, but it looks like a bounce can happen here. And it can run maybe up to 36, 34, 35 area. Matt, what do you think on Delta? So same deal, you know, the 50-day the moving average is about three points away. I hope they do have an upside surprise. We, we'd be looking to short it if it hits that. Um, you know, oil prices, the path of least resistance right now is higher. You know, don't fight the Fed, also don't fight OPEC. So, and, you know, and we believe that not only are we going into a recession, we're already in it. Um, not a huge fan of, of anything travel related here. Okay. That's, uh, I'm in the same boat. I think and we looked at tickets to go to Florida. I can probably fly to Australia and have a better currency rate down there and have a cheaper trip than just going to Florida. But let's move on to BlackRock. They report Thursday pre-market. Can they beat estimates? Business, business conditions are tough, tough as we all know. And competition is coming into the ETF space where they rule the world. Vanguard and State Street are making progress on that front, but we're here to talk about the earnings and what we think can happen. Matt, what do you think about BlackRock? So not a huge fan of the financials here. Um, Jim Cramer actually came out on Thursday and was positive on them. So we'll take the other side of that trade. Um, I do believe BlackRock, I heard somewhere BlackRock was somewhat responsible for that trade that got the UK pension fund in trouble. Um, if that's the case, that's probably not a great look. And, you know, if you look at the daily chart of BlackRock, it's it's got what's called or sort of, a, you know, an island reversal, which is an extremely rare chart pattern to see. It's also an extremely bearish chart pattern to see. Um, so, yeah, no, not 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 a fan of BlackRock here. OK, Brendan, what do you think on BlackRock? So in contrast to the chart of Dow, 
D, uh, delta. This one is reversed oh. or moving lower. Uh, I share Matt's sentiment. The financial, there's something wrong with the financials. Like they, they started to break more aggressively two weeks ago than a model that we use for them. So something, and the, I guess it, I guess it foreshadowed Credit Suisse, I guess in a way. But um, BLK's numbers for this quarter are going to look dreadful. Revenue is supposed to be down 14 percent. EPS is supposed to be down 30 percent. This is the hazards of being in a financial in the wealth management business uh, and relying strictly on fees. I, I like Morgan Stanley when I was at when I was there. Uh, co in contrast to my previous shop at Bear, uh, transactions versus fees. Well, you know if you're going to live and die with fees, this is what happens. You're going to lose money when markets go down, when people get um, bearish, so to speak. They don't have a lot of bearish ETFs to offset their portfolio. Um, so with performance fees lower and assets falling, uh, their one saving grace is the U.S. ETFs are actually seeing inflows. Strangely enough, it's all outflows globally. Um, I don't think the story will be great. They'll probably pressure stock further following the announcement. Uh, there's something brewing in the financials, and I, I know they're down. And everybody's down, but they're down more, and I, I don't know what it is. There's something brewing out there. Matt brought it up a little earlier that there's probably some other problems, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if BlackRock's chart is telling us there's more issues. Okay, and then the last one we're looking more in depth at is um, reporting on Friday's United Health Group. While September was a tough market for them, it is refreshing to look at a stock that is in positive territory this year. That sell-off could be seen as an opportunity, as many have been touting the healthcare names as a safe haven in 2022. But we know that overheads are increasing, and in, cor in, cor and in the corresponding period last year, we did see an aggressive sell-off in the stock. Do you like the healthcare space here, Matt? We, we do not. Uh, you know, hate to sound like a broken record, but there's actually no space that, that we like healthcare included. Uh, UNH on a daily chart is sitting right on its 200 day moving average. You know, to us, a, a, a break below is, is a short sale entry on this one as well. Brendan, what do you think here? I guess well, I think it does look like it could roll over here. Yes, it, I, it's tough to pull coals in UNH because it's been such a rock solid company. I mean, they've just been spitting out money and taking advantage of the healthcare system. <laughs> My wife works in healthcare, so I sort of we I sort of get an insight into this sort of stuff. But um, I mean, the stock from 2015 has been a rocket ship for a four times mover. Um, so I'm going to try to pull coals in the story a little bit here. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts in healthcare that could filter down to the insurance side. Uh, nursing hiring is up. So if nursing hiring is up, that means there's more visits to the hospitals and more visits to the pediatrics and all that sort of stuff. That means more insurance claims, which means less profits. Also, doctor's visits that lead to surgeries is up. Uh, don't ask me how I found this data. I just did some digging and I found this stuff. Um, doctor's visits up that leads to surgeries. That's a big deal in terms of insurance impact. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were talking during the pandemic, uh, I think it was Aetna, their, insur their medical uh, loss ratio was like rising, like they they were making more and more money because nobody was able to go to the hospitals and stuff. We're all locked down. So they were like profitable as anything. Um, I wonder if like they had a, UNH had a medical loss ratio. Uh, it helped to beat in the second quarter. I wonder if that reverses in the third quarter. They did beat by like 38 cents last time though. So I wonder if the market is just saying they're not going to beat by so much. I think that's why the stock is rolling. Um, I mean, nothing goes up forever. This stock reversed in 18 and traded sideways for the whole year. Uh, we probably in the same sort of like same sort of setup. Um, so I, I doubt they'll miss, but I wonder if the beat just won't be so astounding and that might not give it a lift to take off. So it, it's a tough one, but it's tough to poke holes in this name, which is probably the reason it'll go down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to like it, love it, leave it. There's a focus on earnings this week, around, and in particular on Thursday, where most of, the, most of the companies are reporting for the week. Big finance focus as well. So let's jump into it. Matt, I'm going to start with you. Citigroup. So leave it. Uh, you know, that one, again, on a daily chart, another island reversal. We'd be looking to short any type of strength. But, you know, again, to go back to what Brendan was saying, you know, we believe where there's smoke, there's fire. You know, if one investment bank is having trouble, eventually that flows through to all of them. I'm not saying this is 2008 all over again, but we saw 
you know, what happens, you know, this stuff does not happen in isolation. We would not be buying the banks and we'd be looking for opportunities to short them. Okay, Brandon, what have you, about you for Citigroup? Uh, I would leave it. Looks like it would fall further to like 39 and a half. I'm not a big fan. Okay. The second one, JP Morgan. Let's go with you again, Brandon. Uh, this is the one I like, surprisingly. Um, they're the biggest scary one. Anyway, uh, they like it. I like it. Uh, it held the 105 level. Could see it climb to 115 and then perhaps 125. But uh, I think they blew earnings last time. So this might be a risky like it. Okay. Matt? I mean, same thing we saw in City. Uh, but if you are going to buy a bank, you know, th this is probably the one you'd want to own. I mean, we're not. But, you know, I, I think this is the best or, or one of the best. Okay. I always like Morgan Stanley. So that's the next one on the list. Matt, what do you think of Morgan Stanley? Yeah, I mean, same deal. Again, we, we keep seeing these island reversal patterns on all these banks on a daily chart, which again is supposed to be a pretty rare chart pattern, but we're seeing it everywhere. And it's extremely bearish. You know, again, not, not a fan of the investment banks here. Brandon, Morgan Stanley? I'd leave it. I uh, failed in the 65 week. Looks like it wants to go sub 75 before turning higher. Uh, maybe 70. Uh, it's not a not there's a longer term chart pattern going down in Morgan Stanley. We noticed it like three months ago. So I know it's tough looking to all these financials all looking very similar, but Wells Fargo, Brendan. Uh, I would leave it. Failed to take out 42 last week and settled below it. I think that's two challenges of that 42. Looks like 39 is the next level. Okay. Matt, I swear it's the last bank. <laughs> no, that's fine. And, and this actually could be the best short setup out of all of them. Because on a daily chart, it's not that far from its 50-day moving average. So if it pops to the 50-day and, and fails on earnings, this could be your best short. Okay. And then FAST, fast and all. It's probably my accent. But what do you think on that one, Matt? Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it actually, if you look at the daily chart pattern, it looks like a bank. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it looks extremely bearish here. Yeah, leave it. All right, Brendan? I'd leave it. Broke through support at 46. Breath has also made a lower low. Um, it is very oversold. So if they were to like, surprise with earnings, they may catch the shorts the wrong way. Uh, but I would leave it. Okay. And the last one we're looking at for you, Brendan, Domino's Pizza. Uh -huh. um, this chart actually quite surprised me. Um, I've been under the idea that these pizza places would be better, but it isn't. Uh, so I'd leave it. I uh, broke through 330, rejected it last week. Looks like it's so slight fast, actually. Looks like it's moving towards 290. Uh, it may not be a straight shot as it's also oversold. It's got that long candle, too. Um, breath is sitting at similar levels to a bounce back in 18, I think it was. So it's setting up that it could squeeze, but the trend is lower, so I'd leave it. Uh, Matt, uh, what do you think on Domino's? Yeah, I agree with Brendan. I, I mean, it, it is a straight shot down. Tried to rally with everything else earlier in the week and failed. Right now, we'd leave it. Okay. Well, guys, that wraps up the show for today. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us. Wonderful to have you back again. And looking forward to talking to you again soon. Great. Thanks for having me. And, Brendan, thank you for coming back as well. And uh, we'll be talking with you next week. Sounds good. And for everyone else out there, good luck investing.